Our second speaker is Dr. Mike Brotherton from the University of Wyoming's Department of Astronomy. Mike hails from St. Louis. He did his Bachelor's of Electrical Engineering at Rice University. He did his MS and his PhD at the University of Texas. His area of expertise is those supermassive black holes known as quasars. Um, in addition to being a high-level, high-powered scientist, Mike also writes. He has published two science fiction novels, Star Dragon and Spider Star. Uh, Mike's other fascinating dimensions, of which there are many, include being the Missouri amateur chess champion in the 1980s um, and going to high school with John Hamm of Mad Men fame. So we're, we're touching greatness here. Mike's um, favorite book is Dan Simon's Hyperion. His Desert Island Disc is 10 by Pearl Jam. I didn't glean from Mike in my, my uh, various investigations yesterday who his favorite superhero actually is, but we might find out over the course of his talk because it's called Superheroic Science. Please welcome Mike Brotherton. Thank you very much for the warm welcome and I'm very pleased to be here in Gillette. Uh, I'm one of those guys that you may have seen on the Big Bang Theory on television. Um, stereotypes have a basis in reality. The, the part that's not quite right is that a lot of us actually have better social skills than some of the people on that show and can talk to audiences. And uh, they're kind of obsessed with science and they're kind of obsessed with superheroes but they seem to have a little difficulty explaining those enthusiasms to normal people. And I see something that has now reached uh, very popular levels through uh, blockbuster films as a way to communicate some of my love for, for superheroes as well as uh, to talk about science. Superheroes aren't very scientific, but science to me is just a way of trying to figure out how the world works. What is reality all about? and it's a systematic approach to that. And even though superheroes aren't the most scientific topic, you can apply science to anything. I think this is a, a nice way of maybe uh, demonstrating a little bit how a scientist think, even on a topic that you might not think lends itself to science very much. So where do we start? There's a famous essay by uh, another science fiction writer, Larry Niven, that sort of reveals how a scientist thinks and how a creative uh, scientific approach to this, this issue of what's real and applying it to maybe made up or fictional things. And this essay, Man of Steel, Woman of Kleenex, <laughs> considers the physical relationship between Superman and Lois Lane and how it might be a little dangerous for Lois Lane if you're around somebody who can push around planets and uh, fly across the solar system and crazy things like this. It might just be dangerous to even be around them, let alone uh, get a little bit more intimate with them. So, uh, okay, uh, that image is a little misleading. That was not what happened to her. But it fit the, uh, the essay from Larry Niven some years ago. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about applying a little bit more of uh, a lens of reality onto some of the superheroes, even though they're not really based in reality. They're fun, it's fantasy. Um, and I've loved them since I was a kid. I loved astronomy since I was a kid. I loved science fiction since I was a kid. I still love all that stuff. I didn't let society beat me out of it and convince me it wasn't fun. Um, I do prefer Marvel to DC. I've got my Captain America on, not Batman or Superman. They're okay, but I, I prefer Marvel to DC. There's a couple of different varieties. If you talk to a real geek, they'll say, oh no, you can't put Batman with the Hulk. Those are two different uh, universes. <laughs> There's a few more universes than that. Those are the two big ones. But I've always uh, enjoyed putting together the different things that I love, combining them and being able to wax enthusiastic about uh, the intersection of these things. And I, I think where we'll start is with the Silver Age of comics. So Captain America goes back to um, 1941, World War II, uh, Superman and Batman before that. That was the golden age of superheroes. In the late 1950s, we had a renaissance in superhero comic books called the Silver Age. 
And what was remarkable about the Silver Age, this really comes about the same time that Sputnik and the Cold War <coughs> were heating up uh, the Apollo program. So science was very important in the public consciousness, space, radioactivity, uh, all kinds of things. So we got an infusion of science into the comic books with the Silver Age. Now, the science part, I'm going to keep the science simple. You don't have to think about equations or work any math. But I want to talk about, in particular, some conservation principles that are fundamental to science. Conservation of mass and energy. Okay, Einstein told us that they're equivalent. You can turn mass into energy and vice versa. But you just don't have mass and energy appearing from nowhere. It's got to come from somewhere. It can change forms but it doesn't magically appear and disappear. Maybe in the comic books sometimes. We'll, we'll talk about that. Conservation of momentum. Okay, momentum's a, a concept that you probably have uh, an intuitive feel for. We saw a bunch of horse riding earlier on. Those horses carrying a lot of momentum. It's hard for them to run around uh, in the uh, rodeo. And I think we all have an intuitive idea how that works. Um, there's some concepts of thermodynamics we understand, how heat flows and energy balance in uh, thermal uh, energy. So there's a lot of scientific concepts that we can think about and apply critically one way or another to different superheroes and their superpowers. Now, superheroes are for fun, they're not for scientific papers. There's a, a suspension of disbelief here. I can accept that the superpower exists without having to believe how it exists. So there's a lot of things that, that I'm willing to believe when I read a comic book or watch a, a superhero movie. That's a little different than when I'm going to watch something that's a little bit more reality-based or what I write, uh, hard science fiction, where I try to get all the science right. Now. Back in the day, the Golden Age and the Silver Age, comics were primarily for kids. And uh, you didn't have to be a scientifically correct. Kids were going to suspend their disbelief a lot more easily about fantastic things than maybe some adult audiences. But superheroes have become popular among adults. The writing has become more sophisticated. The artworks become more sophisticated. They've been translated to TV and movies aimed not just at kids but at adult audiences. So we can start to apply a higher level of sophistication to our expectations, I think. An adult audience won't suspend their disbelief quite as easily as a, a, as a kid's audience. And I, I appreciate this because the comic books kind of grew up as I grew up. They got more sophisticated as I became more sophisticated. So I think there are people of my generation and, and younger who continue uh, a love for comic books and superheroes into adulthood in a way that was different maybe in the past. And I'll talk about this concept of the retcon. So you, it's, it's basically a way of changing the past history of a character to account for new ideas. And as we went from uh, the 40s, 50s, 60s with some very questionable sort of origins or superpowers, uh, these have been changed over the years to be more realistic sometimes. And I'll talk about instances of that. And the, the, the technical term is retcon. So we'll talk about some of my favorite superheroes and their, their powers. Um, we'll talk about some realistic superheroes. There are some that try to be a little bit more reality based. We'll, we'll discuss how successful they are. We'll talk about some real life superpowers that we're now capable of, either through exceptional training or abilities that real humans have, uh, and technology. And if you've got some favorite characters or superpowers you'd like to talk about, uh, keep them in mind and we can do that a little bit later. Okay, so I, I did give DC a little bit here with Superman and Batman and Flash. We'll, we'll talk about some of those guys too. It won't be all just Marvel. And uh, there, that's Aquaman over there. He sucks. That's... <laughs> okay, I had to get that in. 
Let's start with the Fantastic Four. They've had uh, several movies. They haven't been my favorite movies, uh, but they were one of the first big Silver Age uh, teams coming out of Marvel. And they specifically were associated with the Space Age and uh, the Apollo program. Uh, not the Apollo program yet, because this was 61 or 62. Uh, but you know, space was big. We had Mercury and Gemini uh, astronaut programs happening. And one of the things that they knew about that was different about the space environment is that there were these things called cosmic rays. Mysterious cosmic rays coming from space. You know, hear that? It's the cosmic rays. I, I warned you about them, okay? <laughs> cosmic rays are real. They're out there in space. They're high energy uh, particles, sometimes heavy nuclei, accelerated in supernova explosions that fly out through the Milky Way. And they do fly through everything out there in space. We're protected here by our magnetic field and our atmosphere on the surface of the Earth. Some cosmic rays will get through, but pretty rarely. But uh, this is something that astronauts in reality do worry about. They have radiation doses that they can take. This is basically a, a form of radiation. And uh, the thing about them is they don't really give you superpowers. <laughs> you get enough of them, they'll probably give you cancer. Okay, so not very inspiring. In the movie, they had some mysterious space storm that came in that resembled nothing I had ever seen or heard about in my astronomy classes or my own research. But again, the Silver Age, a lot of exciting science going on. And Stan Lee and other writers of the time uh, wanted to exploit that. It was exciting stuff. Make that the origin of superheroes. Now, one of the original members is uh, the Invisible Girl. Later, I don't know how long it took her to grow into a woman, but she became a, a woman. And she has the power to turn invisible. When they first uh, introduced her, that's all she could do. And later on, they realized that was pretty useless in a lot of big, high-powered combat situations. They wanted to make her a little bit more useful and powerful, and they gave her force fields. And that was kind of cool. So accepting that she has these powers, um, a problem occurs to me. We see by detecting light focused onto the retina of our eyes. If our retina turns invisible and stops absorbing light, how does she see? <laughs> she should be blind, which is like even weaker than just, I'm invisible, I'm going to fight you now, into I'm invisible and I can't see you and you can't see me and... Maybe she can fight Daredevil or something like that. That would work out. So I was thinking about that, and I didn't want to just be negative. It's like, what could you do? What could you imagine to make, make this problem go away? Get creative. Think about some alternative science to help fix her problem. So I think there's a couple of solutions. The one I like, my retcon, what if she isn't actually becoming transparent? What if her body has gained the ability to emit light? So light coming in one side comes out the other. You know, she absorbs it and she emits it. It lets her see. It's not actually true transparency, but she has the power to emit light perfectly to make herself effectively invisible without being transparent. So I think you can use a little critical thinking and a little bit of scientific know-how to come up with something that's also ridiculous, but at least <laughs> won't leave her blind. Okay, Human Torch. Uh, his power is that he catches on fire. That doesn't seem to hurt him, so that's the, the part where you suspend your disbelief a little bit. Uh, I remember back in the 1970s, there was a Saturday Night Live skit about bad costumes for children for Halloween. <laughs> there was a costume that came with a bunch of oily rags and a match. Uh, <laughs> which illustrates the problem a little bit. You know, oily rags and a match, something is burning, okay? The Human Torch, 
Uh, he catches on fire and he can throw fireballs and fly and all this nifty stuff. Uh, he doesn't catch on fire himself, but, what, but what's burning? We need an energy source to produce uh, that heat, you know, conservation of energy. So I started thinking, what could we do to make this a little bit more plausible? Maybe a little bit more interesting. It's still going to be freaky dangerous and kids should not duplicate this. <laughs> but there's uh, various principles of, of physics that, that gave me a possible solution. Okay, <laughs> pair him with the Iceman. Okay, I don't know where the Iceman is able to suck all the heat out of things, but maybe he's channeling into the Human Torch, okay? And uh, together, uh, the energy balances, okay? They would probably have to be an amazing duo team. They'd be roommates, a little odd couple action going on. <laughs> maybe some possibilities for uh, interesting character <coughs> development in comedy. Okay, let's uh, hit on a DC character, the Flash. There have been a lot of versions of the Flash over the years. Here's three of them fighting Captain Cold. So we've got the Golden Age Flash. You can see his hat, it's supposed to be reminiscent of Mercury. We've got the Silver Age Flash, Barry Allen here. He got his powers through uh, a chemical, an accident involving a lot of chemicals and lightning spilling all over his body. So he's, this is sort of the old style mythological based hero. And this one's the science based Silver Age hero. And then uh, the guy in yellow up there, that's the Kid Flash, who later became the regular Flash after he died. But I think he's come back and he's still the Flash, so I don't know what's going on. <laughs> they, they need a retcon, they always need retcons. Just gets more and more confusing over the years. But you think about these guys, their power is to run fast. And some of them were, could run so fast that they could basically vibrate all their molecules and run through walls. And you used to have these little panels in the comic books where they would justify this and try to help you suspend your disbelief. They would talk about stories of uh, pieces of straw in tornadoes that were able to go through doors because they were flying so fast. Okay. I think that was probably a little damaging, uh, but somehow the Flash could run through a wall because he was going so fast without being hurt. There are other issues. When you go really fast, there's a lot of heat, a lot of friction. So I really don't know why these guys don't burn up like the Human Torch. Uh, but they don't. But the other thing is we know how many calories it takes to run a mile or 10 miles or across the country and back. Um, these guys aren't carrying that much fat. <laughs> okay, uh, but there was a retcon. Um, at one point they decided the flash was a little bit unscientific and they were gonna make it a little bit better. And when uh, Wally West took over and became the flash, they slowed him down a little bit I think you can only run six or 700 miles an hour, which is actually a lot slower than the uh, previous guy. And they gave him uh, massive hunger pains so that before he would go into action, he would like go eat a whole plate of hamburgers like Wimpy or something, okay? You know, and he could eat them really, really, really fast too. So you gotta worry about that kind of thing a little bit. So their retcon was, well, they eat a lot. <laughs> and then you just pay, don't pay attention to these other issues. So maybe it was a little better. There was an idea that uh, a flash needed to have a high metabolism and uh, a lot of food to power them. So the concept was good. I, I liked the concept. And I don't know why Captain Cold is smiling, because he's going to get his clock cleaned here in a millisecond or so. There's another category of super, it's pretty common on both the DC and Marvel sides. And that's uh, characters who can shrink and characters who can grow. On the DC side, you've got the Atom. On the Marvel side, you've got uh, Ant-Man, who later became 
uh, Giant Man and his uh, companion, the Wasp. Uh, they were on the Avengers. They haven't shown up in the movies yet, but maybe the third movie, because they're not going to be in the second movie. But there's a big problem, very big problem, that if you suddenly grow, you've suddenly gained a lot of mass. And it wasn't that these characters just, just sort of inflated and you know, kept the same weight. Uh, they literally gained mass or lost mass. OK, that doesn't seem to happen. It's not very scientific. Uh, the Hulk has a similar problem. And I occasionally see, uh, see science fiction movies and things where uh, you could solve the problem by putting big plates of hamburgers back there, maybe. Uh, solve it in a similar way to The Flash, but it's a problem. Okay, Changing mass is not something that we, we usually see happening. Uh, that would be a big violation of conservation ideas. According to Marvel, their retcon at some point, they said, well, okay, you're right, mass isn't conserved. There's another dimension of mass. And you can steal from it, you can put mass back there, and somehow that just magically happens. I should say the DC character, the Atom, who can shrink, he uh, gained that power by virtue of finding a piece of a white dwarf star, and somehow, I don't know, it just got weird after that. <laughs> now related to that, there's some other characters out there. The Vision from the Avengers is one of one of them, and he has a bizarre backstory. There was a World War II human torch, and that human torch was an android. I don't know why, but he was an android, and later he became deactivated, and an evil robot named Ultron used that android body to create the vision. This stuff just gets weirder the more you delve into it, okay? <laughs> but they've had 50, 60 years of, of soap operas to develop all kinds of interesting characters with backstories you can't follow. Forget the science, just, just the history is, uh, is difficultly enough. And one of his powers is the ability to control his density, okay? Density is a scientific concept it's just mass divided by volume, okay? You already have a good idea about the density of objects. You hold something that's a particular size object. If it's heavy, it's dense. If it's light, it's not so dense. But it depends on mass and volume. So the vision doesn't change his volume. He stays the same size, but if he's changing his density, he must change his mass. So maybe he's exploiting this other dimension that the other characters do too. And Somehow the mass comes and goes, but it doesn't change his size in this case. So his density changes. And one of his powers, when he lowers his density, is the ability to walk through walls. Intangibility. Now, sometimes this gets justified by a correct scientific principle that says atoms are mostly empty space. The mass is predominantly in the nucleus. And then there's a much larger area that the electrons live in. Uh, but the fact is, how solid something is, is really a function of those electrical forces. When, when I knock on a table, the reason my hand doesn't go through the table, even though the atoms in my hand are mostly empty space, is because the electrons in the atoms in my hand are being repulsed by the electrons with their negative electric charge and the atoms in the table. So those electrical forces keep things from passing through each other. So really, if the vision is going to be intangible, somehow he has to do something to control the electrical forces that prevent things from passing through each other, not changing his density. It is cool when he walks through walls, though. <laughs> but he's got a mass conservation problem, too. Now. Marvel's got another character from the X-Men. Uh, she's introduced as Kitty Pride, and they gave her a bunch of different names that never stuck, so she's kind of referred to as Kitty Pride still. And she did appear in at least the third uh, X-Men movie as a little girl who can walk through walls. So she can walk through walls. 
Another problem you might think about is if you become intangible and can pass through things, why doesn't she fall to the center of the earth? <laughs> right? She's still got some mass maybe and the gravity can pull her and, well, somehow just at the bottom of her feet, <laughs> she can use some kind of electrical manipulation to walk on the atoms of the air. Okay, and her powers, when she does walk through things, can disrupt electrical systems. So maybe somebody was thinking about these electromagnetic forces and that's really what keeps you from falling through things and keeps things from passing through each other. So maybe she can manipulate the electrons in her atoms in various ways. Seems like a very complicated scientific problem to me, but she looks very determined, so I think she can do it. So I, I like this a little bit better. There's an electrical component to it uh, and her, her phasing rather than just claiming that her density is changing. Okay, uh, Green Lantern is not the most respected character in the DC Universe or in the movie-going world after Ryan Reynolds' portrayal. But uh, one of the things that comes up in the, in the mythos of Green Lantern is part of a sort of an intergalactic police force. It's all these aliens who've got their power rings and have a chant and have a lantern and it's kind of silly. Um, it's DC, I can say that. Now, they get their power from this ancient alien race that lives on this planet called Oa. And in the movie, Oa is portrayed as being at the center of the universe. Okay, I teach cosmology, it's my day job. Uh, the universe doesn't have a center. Now, it's a misconception that it does or that it should, but it really, it really doesn't. We think it's just infinite and any place is like any other place. But they had to put freaking O at the center of the universe because that sounds centrally located, I guess. And where would you put the center uh, police headquarters of your intergalactic police squad in the center of the universe, right? One thing that uh, I, I teach science fiction writers and my, my students, the universe is big, really big. It's a totally big, giant place. The galaxy is huge all by itself. I think it'd be just fine if they were operating out of just the Milky Way galaxy, not worrying about all those other pesky galaxies out there where trouble can rise. And uh, they could put Oa at the center of our galaxy, where I happen to know there's a supermassive black hole and potentially unlimited power to tap, okay? That's what makes sense to me. That's what I would do. So just go with a galaxy. It's good enough. Your, your aliens don't have to be from another galaxy. They can be from this galaxy and still darn far away. It's a big place. So we had a, a movie version of, of the Marvel superhero ripoff of Norse mythology, Thor, uh, a couple of years ago. We have the second Thor movie coming out next week, I think, or two weeks from now. Anyway, uh, it's coming up. And uh, she didn't really have that huge of a part, but she does get featured as the woman of science in his life. Uh, in the comic books, uh, Thor's uh, first girlfriend was a nurse, not uh, a scientist, but today she can be an astrophysicist. And uh, they employed some science consultants for this movie. They wanted to make Thor a little bit more reality-based, and I suspect they worried about a uh, superhero mythos with Iron Man and technological heroes, mixing them up with gods. Okay, Thor is powerful and he is a little godlike, and my wife thinks he's very hot. <laughs> Anybody think he isn't very hot? <laughs> he got this part, he's, he's kind of hot. Um, but there's a concept from hard science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke that says any sufficiently advanced science is indistinguishable from magic. So they went for a science angle to explain a character who in some ways is mythological and magical. I kind of like that. And 
the Bifrost Bridge that connects Asgard to Earth uh, is, they call it in the movie, an Einstein-Rosen Bridge. This is a fancy technical name for wormhole. So Thor in the movies never seemed particularly astute to me, uh, but he apparently understands Einstein Rose's bridges and general relativity in a very deep way that's very attractive to a, the woman of science, played by Natalie Portman. Okay, let's talk about flying. It's one of those basic powers. You know, everybody wants to fly or have some superpower. Flying's a pretty common one. You know, you can get in an airplane and fly, but I guess it's a lot cooler when you can just, just do it. There's been a lot of approaches to flying for different superheroes over the years, different characters, different comic books. Iron Man's got jets in his boots. There was a space-based superhero, Adam Strange, had a jet pack. Uh, Storm from the X-Men can manipulate winds and weather, so she can just get a big wind to blow her around. I think that would mess up her hair more than it does, but they always look good when they land. There's some characters like the Vision we just talked about in Human Torch that have been characterized uh, in terms of becoming buoyant, and a buoyancy lets them fly. They become lighter than air, and they float. And Human Torch can also jet quite a bit, with this power to control the, the fire. So I think... I think those are, those are okay. Another one I think is okay is not really flying, but jumping really high. The Hulk gets around with his mighty giant leaps. And Superman, in the beginning, couldn't really fly. He could, he could jump over tall buildings because he was super strong. He was an alien. And uh, coming to Earth with lighter gravity, let him make big leaps. You saw the John Carter movie, Human Goes to Mars. Really shouldn't be able to jump that high, but he's got the power of jumping high. So those are sort of plausible. But there's a lot of characters who don't fit into any of those categories for how they fly. They just fly. Okay, how? I don't know. It's magic. Um, Superman seems kind of magical in that sense. He can hover, he can fly, he's uh, violating some some rules of conservation of momentum. Normally, most of these methods depend on uh, being able to conserve momentum, throw something one way, you go the other. If you saw the movie Gravity, in some ways, that's, they're, they're flying around in space and they wanna go one direction, they have to throw something in the other direction, whether it's a, from their own jet packs or a fire extinguisher or literally throwing an object lets you get around. But I kind of have to call Superman. I couldn't think of any good way to make him fly the way he flies. And he's not the only one. There's plenty of characters that can fly, and it's, it's very disappointing to me scientifically. OK. So I mentioned the Hulk. This is a scene from, I think this was Ang Lee's Hulk movie. I haven't quite done the Hulk right, but I kind of like it when he throws a tank. That's pretty cool. <laughs> now, he gets his power from exposure to high-intensity gamma rays. And like the cosmic rays, they'll just give you cancer or kill you. Okay? They won't give you superpowers. So another bad uh, idea for a kid's costume is um, gamma rays to turn him into the Hulk. Okay? Don't, don't give him gamma rays. It's bad. Now, one other thing that's in this clip that I think is pretty interesting, I, I saw a physicist write up a treatise on this very brief scene. And it's not calculating how strong he has to be to grab a tank and throw it that far. You could do that calculation. He's really strong. But the thing that this physicist focused on was how sticky does his hands have to be for that not to slide out of them? <laughs> And that's something else that you can calculate in physics, uh, coefficient of friction. And it turns out they have to be really, really, really sticky. The Hulk should be able to climb walls like Spider-Man with hands that sticky. Okay? 
Are you getting tired yet watching this over and over? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and he's considered a superhero, but he was always just like, rah. With sticky hands. It's kind of, kind of disturbing. Let's move to some things that are maybe a little bit more realistic in that they rely on, on technology or training or, or other abilities. But Iron Man was really laughable when he was introduced, in my opinion. So here is uh, Tony Stark demonstrating to the military back in the 1960s his uh, new technology, transistors, really amazing transistors. Transistors, you may be aware of, are electronic uh, components, and they have the ability to amplify electrical current. Tony Stark's transistors can amplify anything. And when they pull this safe apart, he's amplifying a magnet with his transistor. And there's a scene in his origin story where he gains the ability to fly not through jets in his boots, but by amplifying the power of suction cups. I kid you not, he has suction cups on his hand and, and he's able to fly up to the, the roof of some building. Okay, um, so that's a little silly and it very quickly just became a, techno a technology driven superhero. You had a genius inventor, rich inventor, a lot of resources and uh, went away from this, this bit of, I've got these magic transistors that can amplify just about anything. Although, it's kind of fun to start thinking about what things you can amplify when you can amplify anything and the trouble you can get into. Now, I still have problems with Iron Man from a scientific, logic-driven viewpoint. And that is, I'm a scientist and I work with high-tech and high-tech instruments. And what I've learned is that if you're trying to build something like a suit of Iron Man armor, one guy with a robot in his garage is not going to do it. Right. <laughs> okay? It's going to take billions of dollars. It's going to take decades. It's going to be over budget, over deadline, for an entire team of engineers devoted to it completely. And, and then it still wouldn't work nearly as well as anything you see in the movie. It's kind of too bad because I... I remember thinking when I was in grad school that uh, I needed to write to Bill Gates and tell him to spend his fortune building a suit of Iron Man armor, because who wouldn't want to do that if they were as rich as Bill Gates? Okay, maybe that's just me. <laughs> the things I think about. Uh, they are building Iron Man suits these days from the military. Uh, they have exoskeletons that can amplify people's strength. They're not flying around. They're not arc power reacted. They've got gasoline engines on them, but uh, they're kind of cool. We're, we're getting there slowly. Okay, a more realistic superhero, maybe Batman. Right, he doesn't have any superpowers. He's got some expensive gadgets. He's a millionaire, he can buy them. But uh, they recently relaunched, they did a whole big retcon in the entire DC universe. And they issued 52 new comic series, all starting with the issue number one and started over and made all kinds of changes. That's just how they do it these days. Don't even pretend to make sense with the old stuff. Just do whatever you want. And in the first issue of the Justice League, uh, Batman and Green Lantern are hanging out together. And Green Lantern's trying to figure out what Batman's superpowers are. Because he's hanging out with Green Lantern and Superman and The Flash and Wonder Woman. All these characters who can like throw tanks around and fly. It's like, super strength? No. Hold on a second. You're not just some guy in a bat costume, are you? <laughs> and I love the little smirk Batman has. It's just... Because how freaking crazy is this, right? This is a guy with no superpowers. He puts on a bat costume and he hangs out with characters who can fly into space and knock down buildings and, and all this kind of stuff. That's kind of a superpower. That's super crazy. Okay, I got to kind of respect that, but it's kind of super crazy. You know, 
But somehow Batman always manages to, to get by and do just fine and taxes the creativity of writers, uh, not so often the science or the physics. Now, there's another superhero. Uh, there's been a couple of movies off of this comic book. It's called uh, Kick-Ass. The second one was just released uh, in August, and I think the, the box office sales were, were down from the first one. We may not see another Kick-Ass, and that's okay. Uh, maybe there shouldn't be another one, because this is what happens when you put on a bat costume and you go hang out with super-powered characters, or in this case, a, a Kick-Ass costume. You know, you get your ass kicked. Uh, the thing about Batman, you think about him fighting all these villains and criminals and so forth, he's got to win like every single fight, right? Just one guy has to, has to hurt him at some point over hundreds or thousands or I don't know how many comic books there are now. Uh, Kick-Ass goes out and the first time he tries to fight some criminals, he gets stabbed in the gut and then run over by a car and spend six months in a hospital. So for realistic, that kind of moves up my, uh, my scale. Because unfortunately, that's the kind of thing I think would happen to somebody without extensive training and preparation and real skills to go out there and put on a, a mask and try to fight crime. So in terms of getting closer to a reality, there's some things about the kick-ass stories that are not very realistic, but I think that part you know, doesn't, I don't have to suspend my disbelief that, that far to believe that. Getting even more real, real life superheroes. Okay, I'm a, I'm a big geek, but I'm not this big of a geek. Maybe when I was a kid, but, but now I'm respectable. You'd have to call me Dr. Quasar, and I'd have to have a super tech gadget that draws in the power of quasars. I don't know how to build that, so. I don't have a costume, but uh, there are people across the country, across the world, that put on costumes and play superhero. And a lot of them uh, just do community work, um, help look for lost pets, uh, volunteer at soup kitchens. Uh, they go out and they have fun. They go on patrol. Um, they call the police if they see something, okay? There are a few of these guys who dress up and they go on patrol and they look to try to kick somebody's ass. There was a HBO documentary documenting some of them, some of them a little bit more hardcore, some of them a little bit more wannabe. There's this guy from Michigan over here in the Batman costume with the pit stains under his arms. <laughs> He's a wannabe. He's been in trouble with a cop several times. Uh, keeps putting on the costume and getting into trouble and they keep arresting him. Uh, and there's this guy down here, he's from Seattle, and I think he's called Phoenix Jones. Uh, and he gets into trouble with the police too, and then he goes out and has a press conference and badmouths them, and they don't like him either, and it's a mutual, we don't like each other society. So he's probably going to wind up arrested like uh, Pit Stain Batman too. Anyway, there are people out there, there are real life superheroes, depending on how you want to define the term superhero. This guy, by the way, with the SH on his chest, that's superhero. <laughs> he drives a really cool car. I think he has fun. Now, there's another uh, documentary. I don't think it's, I think it's been discontinued now. I didn't see a new season this year. Um, Stan Lee's Superhumans. And it's mostly a series about this guy. And I've forgotten this guy's name, but uh, he has the ability to do that. Uh, he has some uh, genetic uh, difference, and his joints will basically bend almost any which way. So whenever it's useful fighting criminals to be able to tuck your legs around that way and twist yourself and put yourself into a really teeny tiny box, he's the guy you want on your team. <laughs> and so he would go around uh, the country and the world looking for people who claim superpowers and testing them. And he found some people that could do some pretty cool things. So this guy, Dennis Rogers, um, who can bend steel. And it seems like he's not necessarily much stronger than other people. He's strong. Uh, but he can overcome uh, pain in a particular way that lets him keep pushing where other people would stop. 
So maybe it's a little bit more mind over matter in this case, but he can bend, he can bend, he can bend bars of steel. It's pretty cool. Okay, this other guy is a wrestler, describes himself as the human anvil, and he hits things with his head really, really hard. Okay, it was kind of painful watching that bit. <laughs> but they tested him, and he has a really, really hard head. It's harder than other people's heads. You know, it's not clear if he always had a hard head or he developed it after hitting himself in the head with things for a long time. But that's kind of superhuman to be able to hit, hit yourself in the head that hard. Uh, this guy down here is blind, and he echolocates like a bat and the comic book character Daredevil. He makes little sounds. Here's the, uh, the echo back and can navigate uh, while being blind. So he's learned uh, to listen and develop that skill. It's possible. So that's kind of cool too. Um, I did a post on my blog some years ago that got a lot of hits. It was my list of 10 superpowers you can have now. Technology lets us do a lot of things. You want to be bulletproof, like Batman's armor? Well, okay, we've got Kevlar. You can be bulletproof. You want to fly? There are glider suits. You can jump off buildings and fly. We do have jetpacks also. They're kind of expensive, difficult to use. They don't let you fly for very far, but we've got jetpacks. You can fly. I mentioned uh, exoskeletons. You can have super strength. You can strap on one of these exoskeletons powered by a, a, an engine and lift really heavy things when lifting is useful in superhero battle. We are working on technology solutions to invisibility. There are invisibility cloaks that are in de development. Maybe they're not perfect. Maybe they're a little bit more like you might see in a movie uh, Predator, the alien technology. Um, We've studied geckos. Scientists have studied how geckos stick to walls. And we develop materials that will let people uh, climb around. The problem with that is if you want to be able to haul yourself around by your fingertips, you've got to be pretty strong. Maybe you need to wear the exoskeleton. Mental telepathy. Okay, this is really just being able to text with your mind. We're not very far from being able to do that. We now have interfaces with your brain. Your brain can control electronic devices. This has actually been done. People, actually it's scarier than this. I just saw a video a couple of months ago where somebody was able to control somebody's hand with their mind from a distance, all using these, these interfaces. You want electrical blasts like the supervillain Electro? We've got tasers. You want to do these heroic leaps? Um, there, there's uh, supervillain Batroc, another one, the Toad, and then there's the superhero, the Tick, who can jump around. Well, they have these, uh, these strap-on devices you can strap on your legs and you bounce around and you see videos on YouTube of these kids hurting themselves. But you can have a lot of fun until you hurt yourself. We have the ability to see in the dark, night vision goggles. Pretty cool. There are characters who are able to project fear, and there are military devices that utilize something called infrasound, very low frequency sound that causes uh, feelings of disturbance and anxiety in people. And one of my favorites, there's an old villain called Pacepot Pete, who he developed a really strong glue and he could shoot people with it and stick them to the ground and steal from them, okay? We now have sticky foam guns that will do something very, very similar to that. So now we're just waiting for Pacepot Pete to make his uh, appearance. If you want to know more, if you think this is a fun topic, there are several books out there on the science of superheroes. Uh, this is by a physicist, and this other one is fun as well. And uh, they're both worth reading if there's something that uh, interests you. And when I teach physics, I like to incorporate some fun concepts to do that. 
And these books are full of some good ideas. I just want to finish up with one last example from one of the more popular characters, Spider-Man. We've now had two recent movie series of Spider-Man. And in the first one, they decided to make his webbing biological. He'd have holes in his wrists and it would come out there. Um, there is a video, I will not show it, but you can go find it where they show you the anatomically correct Spider-Man and where his webbing comes out. <laughs> Getting a little scientific about this. Um, in the more recent Spider-Man movie from last year, uh, it's uh, technological, and it was technological in the comic books, uh, uh, kind of cable that can be emitted from devices on his wrist. But, uh, you know, either way, I don't know which, but it's fun. Thanks. Somebody have a favorite superhero I didn't discuss, or? You said there's no center of the universe, but the universe is expanding, right? At, at always faster, it's accelerating. Mm -hmm. Does it have to come from a point like the Big Bang, the point of the Big Bang, or where is it? The Big Bang was everywhere. And everything expanding away from everything else, wherever you are in a universe like that that's expanding, you look around and you see everything moving away from you as if you were the center. But no matter where you go in such a universe where everything's expanding, you'll see the same thing. Is it kind of like a balloon? So an analogy that's often used is you draw galaxies on the surface of a balloon, you blow up the balloon, they're all moving away from each other, expanding. Where's the surface of the balloon? You can be anywhere and you'll see the same kind of expansion. Yeah, very common misconception, including for writers of Green Lantern. <laughs> yeah? I mean, how many of you are black holes? How many of are in the two doors before? The black holes? Um, we think the black hole itself is just a point, but there's a region around it that light cannot escape from, and that can be relatively small. If we crush the Earth, down small enough it became a black hole, it would only be about uh, the width of my thumb across, okay? The one in the center of our galaxy is quite a bit more massive than that, and it's something like the size of our solar system or the inner part of our solar system. Uh, and there are black holes out there in other parts of the universe even bigger than that. They're actually kind of small compared to the size of the galaxies in them. So the black holes don't suck everything in. Um, just like the sun doesn't suck the earth in, we just orbit it. Uh, these black holes at the centers of galaxies just, uh, just sit there. It's actually hard to get things to fall into them because things tend to orbit around rather than fall in. Maybe I should have given an astronomy talk. <laughs> yeah. So if the hole has to have super, super sticky hands, how does he let go? You got me. Although, one of the things that uh, this gecko technology is really interesting about and how geckos work, geckos don't have intrinsically sticky skin, right? Um, and, and they can run up a wall. Uh, turns out that the, uh, there's a principle called the uh, van der Waals forces that geckos rely on. And they can bend up their foot in a particular way that releases the adhesion. So maybe the Hulk Yeah, I'm, I'm stretching here. <laughs> but, but there are ways of, of sort of turning that on and off naturally, just depending on how you apply your, your force. Yeah? So why would it have to be sticky? Why couldn't you just compress his hands and hold it like we do when we spin stuff? I He's probably strong enough he can. So that's maybe another solution. He just, he just crimps the end of that, uh, that pipe, and he's got some mechanical forces helping uh, in addition to the friction. Um, but I was really impressed with the calculation on this website that had been done. And, like, I hadn't even thought of that. That's kind of, that's kind of cool that we can calculate that.
Yeah. Like you go down the same path with sci-fi and, and Star Trek and all of the kind of science that goes in there. Um, my talk uh, at a previous Saturday University was the science in the movies, focusing on science fiction shows. So I'm critical there too. Uh, you know, it's okay to have fun with things and overlook some inconsistencies. Uh, but my take on things is you don't always have to just pretend. You can get the science right and the story right in a lot of cases. Uh, you shouldn't make mistakes because you're ignorant of science. Uh, take the recent movie Gravity. They actually had a lot of science consultants. They understood a lot of the science involved necessary to make the movie Gravity. They still got some things wrong, but they were almost all intentional. That they made specific choices to make the story work in a more natural way, requiring less explanation. So they did it consciously, and I can respect that. What I can't respect <coughs> is, oh, we have no idea how science works, we have no idea how reality works, so therefore anything goes. Because um, then I lose my suspension of disbelief and can't follow the movie as uh, something realistic. And the equivalent on the humanity side would be bad acting. We all know how humans are supposed to behave in real life. And when you see somebody in a movie who is not behaving realistically as a human, you say, oh, that movie was bad, the acting was terrible, I couldn't, I couldn't stay in the moment, I didn't believe them as characters. And for me, the science is the same way. It's the universe as your character not behaving the way it should. And I think if we had a higher level of scientific literacy, people would uh, have more problems with that kind of issue in movies and entertainment than we do. But we're all experts on humans, so we can tell when it's bad acting. <laughs> At least I, I can now. When I was a kid, I thought Gil Gerard in Buck Rogers in the 20th century was a great actor. I thought Mark Hamill in Star Wars was awesome. <laughs> It's hard to watch them today. So are zombies possible? Some zombies, maybe. <laughs> That's a whole other talk. <laughs> the science of zombies. I actually have a friend working on a science of zombies book, so. Yeah, science of anything works these days at some level. Yeah. I was fascinated by the quote that you flashed from Arthur C. Clarke that said advanced science can be seem indistinguishable from magic. And can you, can you just talk about that a little bit? The, idea, the ideas about the relationship between science and magic and how that works and, and why it is that, what it means when somebody says science can seem indistinguishable from magic. Imagine you're a dirty, stinky caveman. And I flash images up on the screen, and maybe they, they even talk and, and move around. You would have no concept over how that was accomplished. I could explain it to you that it depends on these physical principles. I would have to start with electricity and build up to this. It would take years. And we have years of education in our backgrounds, and we have cultural expectations about the things we see in our environment. But just a, a TV screen of any size showing images like this would be total magic to somebody. Not understanding electromagnetism, radio waves, uh, all kinds of technology. So it's easy to imagine just our level of technology being magic to people. Um, you know, there have been some primitive societies that were not in contact with, uh, with the rest of civilization. And when they started seeing airplanes and things, they thought they were magic gods. And they would, they would build things to try to make them come back. Uh, so this is very natural for, for humans to fall into its magic until it's explained to us. Science is a pretty recent concept for us. That Einstein Rosenbridge, you said they're like wormholes? Yes. So do wormholes exist, or they're theorized, or? There are theoretical solutions under Einstein's general relativity that says wormholes can exist. We can, we can solve equations and it works. In reality, we've never observed one and there are some intrinsic problems. <laughs> to hold a wormhole open, we need something uh, we call exotic matter in physics that has <laughs> negative energy density and basically anti-gravity rather than positive gravity. 
Theoretically, as far as we know, it could exist. We've never observed it. It may not exist in our universe. So a wormhole goes from one reality to another? So it one goes from one place in space to another okay. in our own universe. It's just the space is shorter through the wormhole. Until recently, you hadn't seen anything exposed on you. That's true. We're still learning. Yeah. On that happy, optimistic note of ongoing learning, let's thank Mike one more time, and we'll be doing that another